In this video, I'm going to show you the very exciting Pithy range from IO iOS. Make sure you stick around and if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button below and keep an eye out for more videos. Hi, I'm Will from Will Surridge Tech and today we're going to be having a look at these. Now this is the pithy range from IO iOS. You may have seen me mention these before on my social media. They have currently got a Kickstarter campaign active and I'm making this video to hopefully support that but also when the devices are released it gives you something to, to look at as a kind of where it started. So in this video we're going to have a look at the devices I have in front of you. I'm going to show you kind of what they are, how they work. I'll show you some of the use cases I have for them. And then at the end of the video, I'll do a build and set up tutorial of this one here. IOIOS, the company, started because a guy called John realized that he couldn't control his stuff anymore. He had a smart home, but it was a complete nightmare to actually control everything. You had to get your phone out all the time because sometimes you don't have automations for anything. You can't expect Home Assistant to know exactly what everything is. Um, so he decided to create a range of IOs, input outputs, for your smart home. This series runs on an ESP8266 uh, chip, a Wemos D1 Mini. And, and that means you can either run ESP Home or TAS Motor on it. And so you can integrate it with many open source home automation platforms. Uh, for this example, obviously, I'm going to show it to you on Home Assistant because it's the best. Don't tell anyone I said that. Anyway, there are a range of different models you have and they all kind of have the same sort of components with them and you just, the selection of components depends, or then creates the model. So all the devices at the moment in the new range have a dial on them, so that's a rotary encoder um, which you can see on these ones. There are an older range uh, called the Detect which doesn't have that. Instead it's got a PIR which you can also get on some of the other models. So you've got a PIR, a rotary encoder, NeoPixels and that can either be in the form of a ring like you can see here or on the Detect here you can see that there are three individual NeoPixels and what you do with them is kind of up to you. Um, and then, of course, there is also the option of a screen, as you can see on these two. And all of these devices have got a temperature and humidity sensor built in. So you can see it sticking out there. On the other, it's actually under the dial. So if you remove the, so if you remove the dial, you can see that it just sticks out there. And they've all got a secret side switch. Try saying that really quickly. Um, so this is the pithy range. I'm also going to mention this range. This is actually the countertop range. It's created out of hardwood and aluminium uh, milled face panel. So this is kind of a more premium range and it's not available at the moment, uh, but hopefully it will be soon, especially if there's enough interest on this. This is kind of a DIY range and all these cases are 3D printed and that kind of thing. So at the moment, it's on Kickstarter, as I said. It's got another week to go on there, uh, but also the shop is open. So if you head over to the IOIOS website, um, there is a shop and on there you can purchase these. So if the Kickstarter has ended by the time you're watching this, then head over there and buy yourself a kit. The kits will either come as a bag of goodies um, where, with all the components, then you have to solder it and 3D print it yourself, or you could get a complete assembled kit. Um, so in terms of cases and mounting options, you can either have them with USB ports directly in the back of them. So if we have a look at this, it's got the USB port uh, and mounted into the back of it. And then you can plug it straight into either a, a socket, a USB plug thing, or if you've got, like me, some of your sockets have got USB ports in the top of them, you just plug straight into that. And that means like above your kitchen counter, for example, there's a plug socket for you plugging in your mixer or whatever. And you can also have your pithy device there. So when it comes to it, you can turn up the volume or turn down the volume while you're doing your cooking or whatever. Alternatively, 
Um, you can have it so the USB comes straight out the bottom, so you could put it straight into a USB plug of some form. Or you can have one with a micro USB. Um, so that's what these ones have got. This has got it on the back, as does this. And it's just a USB cable, and then these can sit on your desk uh, and be controlled or be powered by a cable as opposed to just the plug. As for what they can do, the options are kind of endless, really, um, because it's ESP Home. You can do what you want with it. So the general use of control is going to be something for like your heating, your music, or your lights. That's kind of typically what you're going to want to control with things. I've also got them controlling things like scenes, um, or you can have them controlling covers if you have covers, or that kind of thing. Um, obviously you can write your own code and make it do whatever, but John, the guy IOIOS, has created a simple, very simple, easy to use code, which I'll show you later on this, where you basically choose whether you want to be doing lights, media, or heating, or all three, or a combination of the three, and you copy the code, you have to change three lines, and that is it. And then it's in, installed and it works. Alternatively, a guy called Milan, also linked below, uh, will has a GitHub where he's got a menu creator system. Um, we'll have a look into his menu in a minute, but basically you can call any service on any action and you can have sub menus and it's really cool. And that's what I've got running in my kitchen at the moment where I have like a sub menu for music, a sub menu for scenes, and I can kind of go in there, oh, and a sub menu for lights, of course. And I can go in there and then control each light or each scene individually. Um, so that's really cool. And of course, if you want to, you can write your own code. So that's what I did on this detect. I've got a really cool automation running on that, which I will also show you later. The first one is my Pithy Plus, which I have in the kitchen above the counter. This is running Milan's menu code. As you can see, the screensaver is just a clock. And on this screensaver, if I press the side button, then it will play or pause the music. I can then dial in through the menus using the rotary dial, and the side button is then a back button. So the first menu I've got is a scenes menu, or scenes submenu. In here, I can activate three useful scenes that I have going on in my kitchen. If we go back, we can look at the music. In here, we've got the volume control first, so if you click on that, you can rotate and change the volume, or we can activate different sources uh, that you might want during the day. If we press back, the last section of this menu is lights. In here, I can toggle on and off the four lighting sections, light groups that I have in my kitchen. So this is the counters below and above in this area and also in the dining area of this room. The next device is the other screen plus, which Flory has on her desk. This is running John's menu or all-in-one code, um, and it's much simpler in that there are only like four screens. So the first screen is the music screen. In here, we can press the encoder to play or pause or rotate it to increase or decrease the volume. If we use the side button, we can go onto the next screen. In here, we have our lighting. So we have the light warmth and also the light brightness on two separate screens. Again, you just dial in the value that you want and it's displayed in the, in the bar above. The last screen is the climate. Again, dial in what you want. And of course, the, the toggle button turns these on and off uh, if you want. The last device I currently have set up is the Pithy Pixel, which I have sitting on a speaker in my sitting room by the sofa. I have this controlling my heating, so if in the evening it gets a bit hot, I can just dial it down there. It'd be really nice if I could use this to control the volume of my speakers and my TV in that room, but unfortunately my amp doesn't allow for kind of volume over IP or anything, so I have no way of kind of reporting that state, which is a real shame. I might see how reliable it is just by using IR to control it uh, and using this to, to change the IR, but I doubt it will be very good. It might be something to look into though. I've also got my Pithy Detect uh, programmed, but I haven't managed to get it installed yet because um, it's still a bit of a work in progress. So this one's got the three nanopixels in it, as well as a PIR sensor and a side button. So I've got all these entities opened up to Home Assistant and I'm running an automation in Node-RED to control what they do. And basically, if it detects motion, 
then the LEDs will turn on and go to a certain colour based on various things. So I've got the first LED is going to tell me the status of the bin. So if it's the day before a bin day, it'll come up either green or blue, depending on which bin it is. And if it is the day of bin day, then it will flash that colour. So to kind of grab your attention as it's a bit more important. The second pixel is to tell me the weather. So if it's raining, it's blue. If it's sunny, it's yellow. If it's cloudy, it's a bit dim and grey. And if it's snowing, it's white. I haven't worked out what to do with the third pixel yet, so if you've got any ideas, please leave them down below in the comments and I'll, I'll have a look at what, what might work for me. As you can see, there is so much you can be doing with these devices. It's not only a way to set your devices, but you can also see the states of your devices, like your heating temperature set or whatever. And it also opens up a number of entities to Home Assistant, which you can then use in your automations, as you've seen with my Pithy Detect. Really, the possibilities are endless. So I'm not going to show you a complete build tutorial of, of these devices because fundamentally you'd just be watching me solder things for a while and that's boring. Um, what I am going to show you is how easy it is to use the code and to program them, despite how complicated they may look. For this example, we're going to be using a pithy screen and we're going to be using John's all-in-one code. So we're going to head up to the IOIOS GitHub and get the example code for the all-in-one pithy screen. We're going to copy that and I'm going to paste that into a new file. I'm going to save this in the ESP Home part of my Home Assistant setup using Samba Share. Equally, you could just paste it into a new file in your ESP Home add-on if you wished. We then need to scroll to the top and edit five lines of code. It is that simple. You need a device name, which can't have any spaces, and you need a device upper, which can have spaces. It's a friendly name. We then need to change the three entities we want to control. So we're doing media player, lighting, and climate. All of mine are mediaplayer.cave, lighting.cave, and climate.cave. So I'm going to write cave in all of these options. And that was that. Really is as simple as that. And then we just need to upload it to our device. So we plug it in, and then I'm going to use the ESP Home command line to do this. Uh, but you could also just use the ESP Home add-on, or whatever other, or ESP Home flasher, or whatever tool you want to use to upload it. You also need to go back to the GitHub and get the Home Assistant configuration file. This is basically to create various template sensors and groups and everything to enable your ESP Home device to get the entities and the states of your different entities um, because that's not currently available. So what we do is we go to the GitHub, we copy all of this, or well, for my case, I've already got a climate set up and I've already got a light group set up through Hue. So I don't need that part. So I'm going to copy the rest of this file and put it in the various sensors files that I've got in Home Assistant. In here, you just need to make sure you're editing the relevant names, friendly names and entity IDs. So obviously, instead of your living room media player volume, then it's, for me, it's the cave volume. And so you just put mediaplayer.cave and change the friendly name to make sense to you. Very self-explanatory. Um, so make sure you've done that. And then you'll obviously need to restart Home Assistant. And these new entities should just appear in your developer tabs uh, in Home Assistant, which can then be accessed directly via your ESP Home device. Once the upload has finished, we can head over to the Integrations tab on Home Assistant and the new ESP Home device should have been discovered. If you haven't done any ESP Home devices before, you may need to click on the ad and find it that way and type in the IP address, but it should automatically appear. You just need to type in your API password and it will pop up. It's as simple as that. Once it's popped up, you can see, you can see all the states that it's created. Um, so I've created a very basic Lovelace dashboard with all of my pithies, just so you can see the sort of thing that is opened up to these various devices. As I've mentioned a couple of times, Milan has created a separate menu-based software generator. So if you head over to his GitHub, also linked below, and download that, uh, then you can open up the menu generator in your web browser. And it's a very simple way of creating actually a very complicated menu system uh, within your device. You just need to enter, obviously, the SSID password and all the relevant information. If you select type, it should automatically fill the PIN numbers. Um, it, but again, if you're having any problems, check them here. And then you can just create a, a menu system. You can see with mine that we've got 
three main sub menus and then in there you can see various different types and it's all completely fully customizable. You can either just choose to use a custom call service and trigger anything you want on these different types um, or you can use some of the more common uh, pre-made ones that he's already made for you. For example, volume control is already there and you don't have to worry about it. Um, so it's very simple to do and then once you're happy with your menu structure you just scroll down to the bottom, generate your config and it will spit out a whole spiel of configuration um, for you to copy and paste into your YAML file. It'll also create all the code that you need to copy and paste into your Home Assistant sensors uh, in order to configure that. So it's a really great bit of software really um, and it just shows how actually quite simple it is to create quite a complicated interface. Now, that's all I have to show you. Please, please check out IOIOS on Kickstarter, or if that's ended by now, then check them out on their website and support this great product and project and, and get one or five or 10, however many you want really. Um, they're great. Nobody wants to have to get their phone out to change the lights or, or set a scene. Smart homes are meant to be easier, not harder. And these devices make life easier. It's an interface right there that's fully customizable and set up. So there we go, the pithy range from IO iOS. Make sure you hit subscribe below and click that bell icon to find out more about my smart tech and how you can build yourself the ultimate smart home.